I have to say this. I was blessed with an absolutely great crew. Um, the cameraman, Owen Roisman, who couldn't be here tonight. Uh, thanks, Mom. Uh, Owen Ro this was Owen's first picture. And uh, I think his third picture was The Exorcist, which is totally different in style. And he he's just, he's long retired, but a great cinematographer. And then the camera operator was a guy named Ricky Bravo. And we were, uh, Ricky had photographed the Cuban Revolution. I was going to say, it's a documentary. He photographed Never. the Cuban Revolution at Castro's side. And then when from the Sierra Maestre Mountains down into Havana. And then when, he, when the revolution settled in, he became disillusioned and moved to Florida and then New York. And Owen found him. And the reason the film looks like, the, like it does is because Ricky could hold the camera in his hands and go anywhere. We never laid dolly tracks. You know, it's all handheld. Sometimes we'd push him in a wheelchair. You know, they didn't have the, the famous steady cam. Many of you know what a steady cam is, don't you? Or do you? You know, it's a thing that, it's a gyroscopic uh, gizmo that straps around the camera operator that keeps the camera steady. We didn't have that. So there's a, a little bit of a shake every once in a while that was never intended. I, I watch films now and I see that that's done intentionally. But it, in The French Connection, he just held the shots as smoothly as he could under the circumstances. So uh, it's just, it's just a couple of questions about the score. I noticed tonight, uh, and, I, and I don't know if this was intentional or not, that the uh, drill that was being used to take the rocker panels out of the car sounded suspiciously like the horns of the score in the rest of the movie. Yeah, I think Don Ellis based his score a lot on the sounds that he heard from the film. But I'll tell you about that. But I'll, The guy who takes the car apart in that scene was a man named Irv Abrams. And he was the actual guy in the police garage who took the car apart in the actual case. So, and, and they put it back together in six hours. Um, and he did it. He just showed me, while we had the camera running, what he did. And that's exactly what happened. Until Scheider said, how much did the car weigh? And it, uh, on the uh, uh, sheet, when they checked it in, it was 120 pounds uh, more than... Uh, it should have been. And so then Irv Abrams said at that point, he thought, what have I not uh, opened up here? And he, re he thought only those rocker panels. That's where they, in the actual case, this is exactly how they brought $32 million worth of heroin in. And they would take the money back to France in one of those cars they bought at an auction. But Irv Abrams was the guy who did it in the film and in real life. The score was written, it was the first score. A lot of people, this was their first film. Um, the editor, Jerry Greenberg, uh, a wonderful editor, that was his first film as an editor. And um, uh, the score was done by a guy named Don Ellis. Do any of you know who Don Ellis was? I hope so. He was one of the great jazz trumpeters of, of my time. He was in his 20s. He died in his 30s. And uh, he used to play at a club on Melrose called Nucleus Nuance. And uh, Monday nights was devoted to his band, which was called a, a rehearsal band. They weren't getting paid except what they got from people who came in to the club um, to hear this band play on Monday night. And he played incredible time signatures that I'd, I've never heard before in jazz or even in classical music. And every instrument in his band was electrified. He had electric trumpets, 
before anyone else, before Miles Davis, and electric drums, all the horns were electric, everything. And I used to go there on Monday nights and, and listen to this incredible music. And shortly before we got the go-ahead to make the film, which was after two years, the film had been turned down by every studio for two years. Some of them turned it down twice. Uh, before Dick Zanuck at 20th Century Fox said that he would make it, but he told us, I don't know why, I just have a hunch about this. He said, you guys better shoot it fast because I'm going to get fired over here. <laughs> and he was fired before we started shooting uh, by his father. And uh, uh, anyway, when I got the go-ahead, I went to Don Ellis on a Monday night and I asked him if he'd like to do a score for a film. And he said, yeah, why not? And this was his first score. It's, it's very far out. It's um, really uh, extraordinary music. And the studio did not like the score, did it? The studio didn't like the score. The head of uh, music there was a guy named Lionel Newman, part of the great musical Newman family which included Alfred Newman, the great composer, and then uh, Randy Newman, of course. But Lionel Newman was head of music, and he came to the scoring sessions when Don was playing this stuff, and he said, I don't understand this crap. You can't put this into the picture. He said, you're hocking up there on the screen, and he's hocking over there with his music. You're both hocking. And he said, you don't want to have everybody connected with the movie be hocking. I understood what he meant, but, but to me, this, this wasn't Aachen. This was really interesting stuff. And, but also throughout the film, there are a lot of key moments where you use absolutely no score whatsoever. I mean, the score is used very specifically and very sparingly. Uh, yeah, there's no score in the chase. Yeah. Uh, I try not to use score whenever possible, and... Um, I used more of this score than perhaps I should have, but just because I liked it. I was a fan. I don't think anybody's complaining. Well, you, you never, the opening's pretty loud. You know, I, I expected a lot of people to head for the exits and, and for their TV sets. <laughs>